occurring in Guanajuato, Mexico, and crossing into Texas at Eagle Pass to the battleground of San Jacinto. At San Jacinto, he was part of 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2008 archaeological teams funded by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department grants to dig up battlefield artifacts and help interpret the last battle for Texas independence. He was a featured speaker at the 2009 Battle San Jacinto Symposium, where he presented the findings of the latest archaeological investigation of the battle site. Manuel also participated in 2001 in the archaeological investigation at the Cannon Battleground State Historic Park and in various archaeological surveys near home at the Palo Alto Battlefield National Historic Park in Brownsville. He appeared in the Discovery Channel's hour-long documentary, Unsolved History of the Alamo. Manuel currently resides in Port Isabel and is a member of the Port Isabel Historical Museum Board of Directors. <coughs> he recently advanced to fellow of the American Institute of Architects and is currently a par partner with the ROFA, or uh, Architects and McGowan. And one thing he left off of his bio, he's also an accomplished individual. Had the opportunity to hear you speak before and see your hard work. Please help me welcome Mr. Manuel. Examples. 
this side of the family, I can't tell you a whole lot of, you know? I mean, it, it starts, uh, my, my grandmother is, is uh, Shole, you know, and she's a Escobedo, but her, her last name was Eguia. Eguia doesn't go back to Spain, okay? So evidently has its origins here, and, and, and she lived to be 106, so I talked to her a lot. And she came from Doctor Arroyo, and, and the story that she tells me in Doctor Arroyo, which at that time was called Concepcion, and that was part of the original trail into uh, into Linares in that area. But but more important is that that she came in on a train, or or the rest of the family came on the caravan, crossed the mountains at Linares. If, you, if you've been through Linares, that's a rough crossing, and and got to to the to the border, and she was 13 years old. She got married at 13, okay? Uh, and my aunt, my, my grandfather, which is Fortunato Scobedo, uh, on top, he, he was 15 years old, and he was already here when they met. They met at the pump there in Hidalgo, and uh, so we're talking about 1913, 1914, very early, and at that time, uh, they, they, what their job was to cut the ski, put them in a cart, and take it back to the uh, to the pump so they could uh, have the irrigation going. Mm -hmm. and, and this was really, you know, one of those things where, where it, uh, it it was it was some of the pioneers in the area. Well, she tells me that McCallum, when she was in McCallum, there was a grocery store, a bar, a saloon, and a uh, and, and a little hotel. They had it. They were in tents and bring in that cart that would go back. And she would cut my uh, my grandpa would cut cut the, the ski, she bundled up, put it in the cart, go back. They ended up getting married. When they got married at Pump, they, went, they, they moved to El Gato. El Gato was before Alamo. Alamo became Nebuchadnezzar. And at that point, you know, uh, she uh, uh, stayed there. And, and my father met my mother there. My mother is, is right there. The little one of the oh. Oh. And she's still alive there, thank God. She's a lovely woman. I mean, she stays she stays with me uh, at the house on the weekends and, and uh, I, I took her to breakfast this morning. But wow. but uh, it, it's really it was like I said, I don't know a whole lot before that, simply because her origins are a little bit, you know, uh, hard to, to come by to come by. But in either case, I wanted to just explain that part. Uh, again, my, my my father came in to make, to uh, uh, met her in Alamo because his parents died. He he was born in Macallan, but he went back to Monterrey. Uh, Wilfredo Mojoso was his name. My mother's name Maria Luisa Escobedo, and uh, he went to the army uh, with Sir World War II came and, uh, and 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 started his life there in Alamo. And uh, we, he had three children: Gilberto, Manuel, and Ricardo. Or Manuel, the oldest, Ricardo, Gilberto, Ricardo. <laughs> But it reminded me of, I don't know if you've seen the Coco cartoon. Yeah. Oh, it's an amazing cartoon. And it, you know, as far as, far as uh, what it was about, it was uh, uh, the thing that I, I, um, I re that I come up with, come out with on this movie is Remember the Forgotten. And it's really important to remember the forgotten. You know, here, the altar with, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, the uh, faces, <coughs> photographs on it to remind us of the, of the, of the, the uh, loved ones that have passed away. Again, we probably don't practice this as much as, as other uh, regions in Mexico. Uh, and and I, I saw it really in Michoacan. I, I saw it during the Day of the Dead. It was really big. I mean, uh, over there, they, they literally take you out of the day <laughs> and, and, and bring out and celebrate that day. So, but the, the point is that it's, in the movie, it was important not to forget your family. And we're all about family, aren't we? You know, in the very beginning, when, when I, and I'm going to start talking about this, the trail down that path is when the reasons why we were traveling, we always traveled north, by the way. We started at one point and we went north, and, and, and like I said, this is where we ended up traveling north. And the times, and, and I'm going to talk about the next 500 years, starting the 500 years. You went on the path, you went to the watering hole, took you where that water hole stopped. You, you, you stayed there, you had family, but the most important thing was your name. It, you probably weren't looking for silver or gold or in the Portuguese slaves, but, you, but that name was needed to go forward. And so you had to have a son to come to carry, or a family member that was going to carry your name and live another day. Many names got lost that are not here today, that we don't even talk about anymore. Those are the forgotten ones, and, and a lot of times it's really important 
to make sure that, that we don't forget those. Uh, when, I was, when I was growing up, my parents used to, we used to have a ranch in Mia, okay? And it was actually part of Porcelos 4 and 5 of Manuel Hinojosa, which was one of the founders of Mia. And, uh, and so we would we'd go on the way up there, we stopped at Roma. And uh, I just was always amazed at the ruins of Roma. I, th I think the reason why the, the old buildings of Roma are still there because the economy was so bad, it didn't progress, and they abandoned them, and it still allowed us to have them today. If not, they would all been torn down with a nice shopping center, okay? And, here, and here's what it, you know, what, what it used to look like, and they, they just look it over. <coughs> I was very fortunate down the road to have been the architect to restore it. So, so uh, uh, you know, you think about that time, and I went there because I saw the movie Via La Mima Zapata. I don't know if you remember that no, movie. No, no, no. With Marlon Brando. <laughs> well, they filmed that movie there. It had all the background and everything in it, and it was so rustic, and, and they, they, I thought this is what Mexico looked like. Well, it really doesn't look like that, but it, but it, was, it was more valley <coughs> than Mexico, okay? And it, that was, that was uh, uh, what was important here. And, and then throughout, my dad loved to go to Mexico. Every summer, two weeks in Mexico. I mean, when I was this big, he plotted out. We're going to Oaxaca in two weeks. Okay, we're going to Veracruz. We're going, we're going to Yucatan. We're going to Zacatecas. And he would, we would go to all the markets, museums, and anything that happened to do with Mexico and travel the road. Uh, it was just an amazing time. I learned so much about it that I think that's probably why my interest is still with it. Today, like I said, I've been going the last 25 years, I go a lot. I find places like this, like in the middle of nowhere. I go and ask someone, he says, oh, there's an old church in the middle out there. Hardly, it's not even on the map. And I go, wow, it's abandoned. And you can see that the rest of the town's not even there. They took apart the town, only the, 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 the church is there. And so many locations are there in, 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 on this trail. And you almost, it's a look at them. So it was really important for me to find out what that was about. So these are just examples of different areas where I go and, and I take a metal detector with me because I find things in the ground. They tell me the story and I have a hands-on and, and it, so it, it's real important to me. Uh, just some of the examples. Right here, one of my most interesting finds, I found this from the 16th century. It has, it has the, uh, the, the, uh, the shield of the king that was, in, it must have been on a breastplate, I don't know. It was on the way to Matawada, middle of nowhere. And, and one of the oldest uh, items I, I, I could find. Pottery, pottery is really important to me because it gives me a period of the time. Knowing the party after a while, you know the, potter, the pottery. And coins, uh, coins will date. This, these, I found all these coins at a location here in, in Guanajuato. It was up in the mountain, from 7,000 feet high, and, and it's just amazing. But that happened for many years on this road that I'm talking about. So I'm feeling the road, I'm looking where my family goes, I have a hands-on, I feel, I smell, I, I experience the people there, and uh, it's just it's just dirt road uh, all the way from Guanajuato to uh, Eagle Pass, or from Guanajuato to Mie. And and on this side, because I've done a lot of studies on the uh, on the uh, Texas side. <laughs> my family, everybody, when I said earlier, that come from Spain, of course. My family tree shows. That my uh, uh, my ancestry is, comes from uh, uh, from Estremadura, from Plasencia, and I show Plasencia right here. It's at the end of the Tagus River, right at the at the end of the range of the mountains that are there before it gets to Portugal. And uh, in in 1591, there was a call for arms, and Alonso Nunez y was 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 read the, the advertisement to go with Oñate to New Mexico, and uh, and, and this exploration. And, and uh, looking for gold, of course, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about that story. But but this is one of my. There's a lot of Inahuasas. I mean, I mean, this is. If you look back, especially on that expedition, there's four or five Inahuasas from different parts. Southern men. Uh, someone asked me if I'm related to so and so. I graduated with four Inahuasas. One of them was Chewy's brother, uh, and not one of those related to each other. So that's how that's how branched off. We, we go so far back that it's, it's really hard to tie each other to it. But in theory, here's really what I found very interesting. Notice that from Spain, we went to the southern part of the continent, okay? We brought in a Catholic doctrine. Brought in, you know, uh, Dominicans followed by Franciscans and then Jesuits. They were the ones that the idea here, the Spanish, as you conquered 
you Christianize, okay? And, and, and it really set up things differently because the Christianized meant leave the Indians alone in the mission, and eventually they mixed with the population. Uh, that didn't happen when, from Northern Europe as they got to the north part of the continent. Completely different philosophy. And, and that is why that part is so different than, 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 than our heritage from Mexico. So it's important to understand that because we deal with that in, in, in this development. So I'm already going back 500 years, okay? One of the things that happened was that this is a map of Mexico, and what's important here is you see Mexico City, and most, most people that came in in the early part of the 16th century arrived in Veracruz to Mexico. Some later on started coming in through Tompico, the Panuco River. That was your entry, La Entrada. And at this point, you know, all this area below the blue line, there was an indigenous population. It was 30 million of indigenous population that lived when, when Cortez arrived. The Mes this was the Mesoamerican line, meaning that on this side, you had more of a, of, of a, 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 uh, a population a, of tribes. There are 60 tribes during this time in Mexico. Everyone with a different culture, a different way. But these tribes within below this line had more of, of a agriculture, uh, had, had, were stationary, did not move. People, indigenous population above this line were nomadic. They moved. They moved from area to area. So it's really important because, because they, in a lot of ways, were, we were, had communities. Like Mexico City, Denver, Chiglán had, you know, a million people in it. You know, it was, just, it was just a lot of people here. Unfortunately, you know, by 1745, half of that population was gone. Diseases, you know, people, in a lot of ways, just had a lot to do with people. <coughs> With, with the decline. And then another, and by 17, by 1575, another <coughs> half went over. So you, by, by to make it, so long story short, from 30 million to 1800, there was only 2 million left. And, and so your population declined. On the other hand, the Spanish coming in, were not coming in that fast. Two to 400 people a year in the first century. So you, so you, your, your population was sort of declining on the, on the indigenous population and the Spanish was coming in very, very slowly. So you had very few families, and, and uh, so I want to, okay, I'm slowing things down a lot because it's really important. Now, the idea was to go north. That's where the silver and gold was. Where was the big mine? Zacatecas. Zacatecas, where they pull out by, by the mid-century, by the mid-60th century, people were going to Zacatecas, and the only problem is, of course, it wasn't popular like this. It was, there was a lot of Chichameca Indians, and they had a, basically a war. You, they could not deal with them. And, and it, it sort of stopped the movement. At that point, it was really hard to push north because of the resistance that these Indians made. This is, this is a, a map showing, you know, again, I mentioned Veracruz. You come back to, this is the only road we all came in. The only other, maybe there was, a, there was, there was movement here from Tampico back and, and coming to Zacatecas. At Zacatecas, everybody started, okay? So everything below that, you know, you had to take this trail. At Zacatecas, you moved up. All our families, if you, if you did not originate in Mexico and came from someplace else, you had to come to a port and had to go up this trail, and Zacatecas was the place you started. So, so it's important to understand that. Midway between Zacatecas and, uh, and Saltillo, and this is, this is a little bit moving about 25 years later, uh, Maxapi, it's a mining town. It's probably, the, it was the largest gold mine, the second largest gold mine in the, in the world. And so it was very attractive. I, again, that trail that I showed you, I traveled it back and forth many times. So, so going up into the mountains here and, 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 and seeing all this was really important. Maxapi was probably where all, everybody was sort of like stuck and all the important people that were trying to move north, trying to figure out how to do it. And there was one man in particular, Don Diego de Mayor, Montemayor, was, was one of these colonizers. He, he, had, he had come into this area in, in about 1575, and uh, uh, he was, you know, David Crockett, Daniel Crockett, these guys were the Daniel Crockett, David Crockett. Another person that was even more popular with the Indians was, was a guy by the name of Alberto del Canto. Alberto de Canto was a good looking, 
you know, strong guy, fearless. I mean, the Indians were fearless, so they were all going north, coming back in, finding slaves. There's a real interesting story here in Pazapir. And Don Diego and, and Montemayor and, uh, really never met, that, met each other, but they did go to the same place. They went to Monterrey, they went to Cerralbo in the very early years and explored these areas. The story is that Montemayor, when he was away, he went back to Mazapil, and uh, he met, you know, he met his, uh, his wife, Don, Doña Juana Porcayo. She was a very influential family in that area, and he had an affair with her. And uh, so when Montemayor came back to Mazapil, it turns out that he found out about it. The town was talking. So he confronted her, and he says, you know, she was a very important person, and then he, he goes, and he's, he says, uh, uh, you know, who are you to tell me what I can do or not? So he got upset and put a sword through her in front of his daughter, the Stefania, okay? and, and killed her. So he ran. He ran and they went after him. And he, but he was going to go and find El Canto, and until he found him, he was going to kill him. And he was not, he was not, the thing was, he was not going to let his beard, he was going to let his beard grow until he caught him. Well, interestingly, he, they ran into each other, and uh, And they, they ran into just because Luis de Carvajal happened to be appointed, was given the land that, that area, and they, uh, Del Canto was from the Azora Islands, which was Portuguese, okay? And, and so a lot of the Portuguese that came into the area were populating that area. A lot of the Portuguese were Jewish. Luis de Carvajal, was one of the, the, one of the, the founders, or the one established, uh, was given the grant to uh, establish colonies in that area, and these guys worked for him. So, so uh, in the process, Carvajal, you know, was also looking for 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 uh, in, uh, the Indians and, and and bring them to captivity. The Portuguese were doing that everywhere. They did that in Michoacan. They did that in in northern Mexico. Well, Carvajal. You know, was was finally taken to trial, and uh, he was uh, he was an inquisition was made of him. His, his sister had already been burned at the stake in Mexico, and and he in turn was also he died in prison about the time that that uh, they were establishing uh, Monterrey. But uh, they they in order to travel to uh, from Pazapi to. Uh, to Saldillo, uh, this was what they had to go through. This is the picture I took. It shows they had to cross the, I don't know how they did it. They crossed this mountain and came on this side going to Saldillo. And there's a picture of the group there that I'm with. We're up there on top of there. That's how it looks like on top of there. And there's a, there's a road. They, they talk, they're taking carts and things. There's no other way to get there, to get to Saldillo. It's just, it's just, it, it's just amazing. You know, you're talking about you know, a good 200 miles across the desert, you know, the, and, and, and I mean desert, I cross that desert, and there's areas you just drive, and there's no roads or anything like that, but, but uh, to me that was the most amazing accomplishment of to have these families come in, and come in, they had to go through that road, and end up in Saltillo, and establish it. Most of the Portuguese, the only problems, they had a lot of trouble with the Indians. There's a, there's a group of Indians that were called the Huachichis that were in that vicinity, and constantly killing off the population, killing the men off. There been a lot of women, and so women, you know, were, were actually involved. Well, coming into this to this valley, which called at that time was called Villa de Santiago, was was the area that that Montemayor and and, and came in. Well, Carvajal had made the Canto there, the same place, live together, and say, you know, you guys are are going to be, we're going to get to live together because you're going to run this this this. Uh, this village at that time, this, this Villa. Villa is a Spanish part. Pueblo is the Indian part, okay? So every time you hear, you know, the, the two terms, they make reference to the European and the other part, the Indian, okay? So, so what happens is, because of all the Indians that were involved in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the, the, the trouble that they had, there was a call. The call was to come back and get help to, to deal with these Indians. Earlier I mentioned the, the idea of, of the populations of, of, of the indigenous, there 60 tribes. One tribe was, was the Tlaxcaltecas. They were next to Puebla, or just 20 miles from Puebla, close to Mexico City. These are the, the, the Indians 
the, the, that were that Cortez took to defeat the, the, the Aztecs. As you know, and I won't go that much in the story, but but they were given all the rights, the double rights during that time. That means they could ride a horse, they could dress like Europeans. They were less, they were prosper. They, what you need, the little red dye, they made a lot of money. By mid-century 1600, they were living in the high in the hog. They were educated, all the Franciscans came there and educated them. They were the, they, they were up there. They were, they were the doctors, the lawyers, everybody else. They were already trained and involved. Only problem is when Cortez died, all those privileges were taken away. And they said, you now, you, you guys, you got in the media that you got to deal with. And he said, there's tribute. But what's that tribute? You got, we need so many bushels of, of corn because Tlaxcala means the, the city of corn, okay? Take the corn to Mexico City, and we got Puebla, we need a build up in this cathedral, so I need so many men to go help do it. This went on for about 30, 40 years. Well, it got to a point where they were already trained, they knew the language, not one language that, that the chief, that the, what the chief of Jamaica knew at that time. And so they said, can you help us out? He said, why should I help you out? She said, you guys put this tribute on, you put this yoke around my neck, and you want me to help you out? He said, I'll tell you what, if you help us out, take care of the Indians in, in Saltillo or, or the other areas north of Mexico, we'll, we'll, give, we'll give your family for 30 years. They don't have to do with these tributes. And we'll give you the land, and you can continue your privileges. 400 families left Las Cala, and they went up this trail to Saltillo. They went to different areas, OK? Some of them survived, some of them didn't. 90 of those 400 ended up in Saltillo. And the Alaska Teca population arrived there. One of the interesting things about it, they arrived in 1590, 1591. While I was there, I took this picture that's shown right here, right at the footsteps of this <laughs> church. And there was a big fiesta going on. And I was a friend of mine, he said, what's going on? He says, yes, they have it every year, September. You know, seven. And so well, there's got to be a reason. Okay. So, so I started checking. Well, that's the year that they arrived in 1591. They were still celebrating to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they were celebrating where the spring was that was given to them. They were given certain rights every year to use the water. Keep in mind, they're at a higher level. The water comes down. And there's a joint. There's a junction. There's a line. There's a street. There's the water comes there to a common area where everybody comes and gets it. This side is the Villa, that side's the Pueblo, and therefore, certain days they could get water at this point, and, uh, and it originated from the spring. And so, so every year they celebrate because water was everything. There was no rivers. In, in, well, you know, when you're coming from Zacatecas or north, there's no rivers you cross. You know, you depend on, on, on rainwater coming and holding the tanks. In. Or, or maybe maybe a, maybe on the spring somewhere at the end of a mountain. That's the only way you're going to get water. Rivers didn't didn't come into play until it was close when you got the Rio Grande River. But but uh, the uh, uh, this was so fascinating to me to see that. Now eventually, these Las Cantecas came by, by uh, 1591. By the year 1620, it took over San Diego. They're basically, and that's one of the reasons why Montemayor left in, in 1596 because. He wanted to go to Monterrey and make sure that that he wanted to separate himself because these Tlaxcatecas eventually got all the rights. They could do. They could go and, and, and have land granted to them. They could raise cattle, ride horses. And back then, the big thing is you were the man if you were on the horse. Okay? The day you were off the horse, you were not a man anymore. <laughs> so 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 uh, every morning, Grandpa had to get on that horse. Right around the plaza, make sure everybody saw him. And he was all right. You know? He went back home, got off, and just you know. And, and, and it was so important to just to show that that manhood in, in these areas. And um, so so when uh, when the mayor went to uh, went to Monterrey, he took his his daughter Estefania. Estefania, remember Estefania, the the, the the lady that saw the canto mm -hmm. murders, the canto married her. Okay. So, so Estefania, after she, after he married her, had three children through Del Canto, and Del Canto, after a while, you know, he was moving around. He had a lot of, he just had a lot of, uh, of friends that eventually just lost interest, and she went with her father and helped settle Montemayor. Del Canto 
you know, put his asiento there in Buena Vista, which is at the entry of the port that comes into Saltillo, and he, and he passed away. But he was still, he, he, was, he was one of the big legends of that area because he, he was, he was uh, as far as his dealings with, with uh, the Indians. Anyway, the family, the modernist family, they did not do a very good, they, they had a real tough existence. Don't think that, when you talk about the Montemayor and the populated area, they were starving to death for the last next 50, 20 years. So, so it, was, it, was, it was not an easy living. Earlier in San Gregorio, which is Cerralbo, your northernmost point, is, is uh, uh, this, here's the cypress trees. Has yeah. you been to Cerralbo? Yeah, yeah. yeah. my big grandmother. Yeah. My big grandmother was from there. And, and you know, it, the trees are huge. You could live in them. And, and I remember when I was a kid, yeah. I would be with Big. Oh, 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 their luster, and uh, I, I'm so excited. Trash areas to the side, and oh, the rivers are, are dirty. The, the the population that was there is here right now. People that are there were slaves, <coughs> and, and most of it, your movement there was a form of Huasteca community that moved into that area. So, and, and at this point in San, San Gregorio, it was really interesting. They left in 1577 when the Tanto was there. She left at this time. <coughs> Uh, the Sosa, one of the, one of the uh, corner. mulatto uh, friends that, that actually came in from, from the uh, Canary Islands, and he left them there. Well, 1526, went back, his family was still alive, you know, was living there. That was the only you know, people that, that were involved. Now, when I mentioned the occupation of Monterrey with Montemayor, these were the only people that went with him. There was nobody, this was the third, this was the third occupation, of it, okay, so it's not the first one. The third occupation, look at the names that are, that are here, Bar Barrera, not Barrera, but you know, you have, you have the Berlanga, Maldonado, Montemayor, De Sosa, there's a lot of De Sosas. They're very, very, all these are Jewish, okay? Uh, Martin de Solis, Garcia, Rodriguez, Manuel, Perez, Rodriguez, Alonso, and Montemayor, Estefanías, these are the only, that's the population of Monterrey. Today, there's over a million people, okay? Uh -huh. So, so it, it's important to, to, uh, to, to see that, that what we're talking about in 16, <coughs> in, in, well, I said, well, 1596, now that's 400 in, in, what, 17 years ago. This is where it starts, and look where we are now. Manuel, let me ask you this. See, now we know why Monterrey, we always say to me, it's all <laughs> no. No. They're all Julios. Yeah. Now, They're Portuguese. You said Zacateca was the second largest coal mining city in the world. Why did they leave Zacateca? Because they were always thought there was more of the greener grass. <laughs> and, 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 and you know the worst part about that is? You, made us, you, you couldn't go back on it, you know? They said, you know what? There's nothing over here. I'm headed back. And somebody's already there. Someone took your place. As soon as you left your place, someone moved in. And so you moved. That's why this this group or the group that's in the valley, they're the ones that were pushed north. We were the first one. We were the, on the front of the trail all the time, and we ended up here. And with the amazing thing about it, from Cerralbo to the valley, it took us a hundred years to move. It took us a hundred years because the Indians were so rough that you couldn't the nomadic Indians. They would they would refuse to be Christianized, and so we we struggled with that part. And uh, did, you, did you did you find out who owned the, the mines? The, was it the Spanish? Was it, was it the Spanish? Got Spanish government to the king, or was it Mexico that owned the mines? The mines. The mines. Yeah, everything belonged to the king. The king. Yeah, yeah okay. everything belonged to the king. You know, but you just got rights. I, I mean, um, I mean, Zacatecas was was really the the, the mining area. And there's a lot of mines throughout. You'll find that the carrot. The carrot is the silver, the mines, and the slaves. Go forward. The other carrot for the Las Caltecas were, you know, you know, get rid of the encomienda that was given to them. The, the Jews were, I need, I need to get away from the Inquisition. That's right. You know, they were, they were after in the Jews. Right. You know, and, and you take my, I showed you earlier, my grandmother in Doctor Arroyo, her carrot was, 
it was poverty. There was a revolution. They wanted to get out of there, and they and they went to to where it was it was it was a better place to live. Mm -hmm. One well, interesting thing here is there's this, there's a uh, Trevinos. Trevinos come in picture. They come from Spain. They come from Andalusia area. In Andalusia, they had cattle, 200 head here and there. He came in, 1,200 cattle. He brought in in 60 only about 1,200 cattle, 1,000 goats, and he established himself in Monterrey. And a lot of the other family came with him. This is the start of the ranching in the 1600s. From here, everything developed. You're talking about the vaquero, the cow. This is where it got started. By 1650, they had already invented everything that, that goes on a, on a cowboy, you know? Uh, and you, you, all the terms that you were cowboys, they're there. And they, and you know what, what I find, uh, even today, you, 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 uh, I, I hope I say the Calabata. Yeah. Yeah, where you have, you, you, have, you have a group of people in horses and they ride to a certain area. Okay. Well, you know, in English, caravan. Caravan. You know, and at that time, the reason a lot of times they, they celebrate the Dia de Santiago. You know, I think it's in June. That that it's there. It, you, you, it takes 25 acres to raise a cow. You had 1,200 cows. Make that to 12,000. By then, these 1,200 were thousands and thousands of cattle. And they needed land. And believe me, they didn't want any goats around there because goats and they were just did not get along. So they needed a lot of land in order to come back and graze. And eventually, that's what led to the, to the river because he found all the land north of the river to be grazing on because they required that much. And we became the, really the cattle country. All of this northern Mexico and southern Texas was where you raise the cattle. We are the cattle, you know, industry. And uh, but you know, you see these. These events, they would go twice a year with the cattle, and the Indians weren't allowed to get on a horse, so they had to go walk along the cattle. Okay, and uh, and then they come back and make a big fiesta. That was a, that was a dia, a dia san, a dia san Diego. And uh, anyway, so but but Trevino is an important person here. Okay, right about this time, there's there's a. A uh, Juan Oñate. Juan Oñate was the second richest man in Mexico because of Zacateca mines, and he was he was uh, uh, he, he, he put an expedition together to go into New Mexico and pick off where Guatemala was and find this seven states of Sibla or all the gold that was in that area, and that's where Alonso was called in. Alonso Nunez in Fosa, along with many other men that eventually would end up in this area of northern Mexico and what we're doing and the Nuevo León Kingdom. And so they would, the call arm was to go Zacatecas and take the trail, you know, through through Chihuahua all the way to <coughs> El Paso and cross the gold and, and, and find this gold. And uh, he, he, the men that were there were, were soldiers who were really enlisted to, to, to uh, take on that, that journey. Um, the only thing is that the road they took. Okay. As you can see, as you, you can see when you get when you get to you go to Zacatecas, so so Brevete, the Santa Barbara, Barbara is all the way to Paso and all the way to this point. This this year I decided to go there. So I, I, I spent my time in this area and I went up up and down this, this river just to see the, the pueblos and, and what what the Spanish were were involved in. Just to again just to see a little bit of my family and what they were doing during that time. Because you, you, you were following the Rio Grande coming in from Colorado. Yes. You and, and, you know, and all the way up to, to uh, Taos mm -hmm. and up, that, okay. the whole Rio Grande River comes through there. Yeah. And, and really, right before you get to Taos is where you're settled. That's where Oñates had its headquarters. But one of the things that happened that I had to go and see for myself was the uh, Akuma. Have you heard of Akuma? Okay. Akuma is this, this mesa. This is 40 stories high. This is a town. They call it the Sky City. The Pueblo, the whole piece were on, at, at, uh, on this, and they were they were warriors. Well, they didn't put up with Ignate. You know, one of one, one, one of his, a, a group of his squad went up to 
to get some food. They have to climb these 40 stories up to get up there and get food. And something happened because Bermude de las Casas was a mule man. He was at the bottom waiting for them to come in. And all next thing you know, you start seeing bodies of the soldiers coming down. Wow. And, and many of them, and, and the squad that was there, they got killed. One